Good morning everyone, hello and welcome back. I hope you all had a wonderful weekend and you are now fully rested, full of energy and ready to get started on what is going to be our last full week of learning. Monday to Friday, last full week. Can you believe it? The time's gone so incredibly fast these last few days. Or oh, last this last term, should I say. So, moving on. Today we are going to be, and this week in fact, we are going to be reading quite a few chapters because we really want to get through the book, get towards the end so we can start to understand the characters, understand the story, and learn all about Schiff's great adventure, his journey. So, with no further ado, let's move on to the re Today we are going to chapter 16 called Courage. As always, I'll read a little bit, then I'll tell you to pause the video, and you read the next bit, and so on, and so on. Okay, chapter 16, Courage. The container gets hotter. I don't know if I can take much more. Binny lies on his back, staring at the ceiling, sweat glistening on his face. I have no idea what time it is, but it feels like a couple of hours since today's brown soup. That means early afternoon. No one has spoken for a while. Now that Jonas has mentioned escape, it's hard to think about anything else. Shouldn't we be making a plan? I whisper. Finding out how we can escape? Jonas said we don't have, Jonas said we don't have much time. Look at them, Binny whispers back. They're barely alive. Normally we sleep in the daytime. I tune into Nibay's voice and realise that he's talking to me. But you're right. We need you to be ready in case you have to have, have a chance to go tonight. I try to concentrate on what he's saying through the veil of heat. We're helping you because you're going to help us. To do that, you must learn each of our stories. We know them already, says Binny. Can you remember everyone's names? The names of the wives and our, our parents? Nibe asks. He doesn't wait for an answer. You must learn the villages we came from, and, if there is one, a phone number. Test each other, and later, we will test you. Okay, says Binny, nodding. Also, there is one thing which Jonas didn't tell you. The guards will interrogate you. It's standard practice. They will wait a few more days until you're starting to really miss your family and some decent food, and then they will take you away for questioning. Only it won't be just questioning. By the time they've finished, neither of you will be running anywhere for some time. That is another reason why none of us was in any shape to escape, even when we had only been here a few weeks. But all we did was pack a bag, I say. Our mother had arranged for us to leave the country. All the guards know. Uh, all the guards know, though, is that we had packed a bag to go somewhere. They will want to know where to, who with, how. They won't rest until you have s until they have some answers. We are no more than halfway round the room when there is a low uh, there is now familiar bang as the bolt slides down. The doors to the container swing open. You, eighty seven, get up. A guard points to me, and you, eighty eight. And you, 24, the guard points to Binny and the small man who served dinner. Outside, now. I step over to the, to the entrance and turn to look at N Nibé, but the guard gives me a hard shove. Nine other men are already waiting outside. I'm not sure whether they are the same men as yesterday. We head back to the metal gate and the guards push us out into the compound. You have 20 minutes. Gather as much wood as you can carry. Three armed guards follow us out and point towards the scrubby thorn bushes at the base of the small rocky hill hillock. I tried to catch Binny's eye, but he is looking down. We're not ready. If Binny runs, though, I must go too. Okay, so you pause the video here and read these two slides, and then we'll move on. Okay, welcome back. Moving on. Uh, I'll read that last little sentence, and we'll move on together. When our arms are filled with thorny branches, we head slowly back to the compound. The other men struggle to walk with their arms full, even though the wood doesn't weigh very much. The guard with small eyes walks over beside me and Binny. Tomorrow we will have a little chat with you, 87. He prods his rifle in my side. You will need to have some answers. The day after, it will be your friend's turn. He smiles, but it's a smile to freeze blood, even in the desert. There is silence as we step inside the container. Binny and I sit back down with Samir, the man we were speaking to before the guards came. He smiles at us. Perhaps he is glad that we didn't try to leave. 
We pick up where we left off, finding out the name of his home village, a phone number for a close relative. Finally, the only person left to speak to is Jonas again. Do you think you'll be able to remember everything you've learnt? He asks anxiously. No problem, says Biddy. It's much easier than by normal theorem. Jonas looks looks to me confused. Sure, Binny's right. It's pretty easy compared to what we have to remember at school. I pause. One of the guards says he wants to have a chat with me tomorrow. I can just make out Jonas closing his eyes. We will carry on as we are, he says. The rest is up to fate. Okay, pause the video here and you read these next two little bits here, these two white sections. And welcome back. I'll read that last sentence and we'll move on together. How do we know which direction the border is? For that, he answers, you need to talk to the, to, tes, to Tesfe. Jonas points to the, to the bread man. I know that he has a wife but no children and he tried to escape from a military camp similar to this one two years ago. Only at that military camp he wasn't a prisoner. He was in charge of logistics. As if the guards have been listening to every word, there is a clank and the door swings open to reveal a figure with a rifle slung over his shoulder, holding a basket of stale bread. Bread must come first. As Tesfe gets up to pass it around, Jonas takes off his shoe and removes what looks like a sock from his foot. I look more closely and see that it is a small cloth bag made from the same material as the blankets. I've been waiting a long time for a chance to use this. You can carry a small amount of bread in here, he says. Saves time if you need to leave in a hurry, which you will. On the far side of the container, Idris takes some plastic from under his blanket and holds it up. Binny steps over to take it, but Idris snatches it back. If they find this on you, then you'll go straight to the punishment cell and you might not come back. Okay, pause the video here and you read these two slides. Okay, and I'll read that last little paragraph before we move on. Welcome back as well. As we are plunged into darkness once more, I am amazed at how quickly I have absorbed the shape of the box and where the people sit. I understand why they always pick the same spot, and why, although it stinks, Jonas has to sit close to the toilet. Binny grabs hold of my shoulder, and we step carefully between the legs and blankets to reach Tesfe. Don't sit on top of me, he says. Stop there, you're close enough. He sits very still, but I can hear his breath wheezing in and out. I know that soon Binny and I will sound the same as him. You want to know how to escape, Tesfe whispers, and whether you might live. It's not a question, he wheezes for a couple of breaths. With one of those I can help you, he says. Assuming you make it away from the camp alive, you'll need to head due west. In the afternoon, your shadow should fall to your left, moving round behind you. At dusk, one of the first and brightest stars to rise will be the southeast. Leave it behind you to your left. After sunset, the room will rise in the east. Head away from it. If you run in the daytime, you'll probably die from heat exhaustion. If you don't, they'll catch you up and shoot you. Late afternoon or dusk is best, but you won't have a choice. The border is approximately 10 kilometres from here. If you walk without stopping, it'll take you two hours to reach it. You have to get to the border before they send out extra troops to catch you. They won't expect you to know how to get there, which is in your favour. There aren't any roads in the desert, which is good, but they have trucks and they have guns. If you can run far enough to get out of their line of sight, then find some soft sand and bury yourself in it. They'll be looking for upright figures in the horizon. The border has a fence and checkpoints. The guards aren't always watching, and sometimes the towers are too far apart for them to see very clearly, but they also have guns. Tesfaye continues in his special quiet voice until he seems satisfied that, he, that we know everything he has to share. And what are the chances of us actually making it away from the camp alive, really? Binny asks. Tesfaye says nothing for a moment. The chances of them ever setting you free from this camp are zero. Your chance of making it away from camp are slightly higher than that. Before Tesfe can say any more, there is a loud bang. I jump. Perhaps they have come for me a day early. 
Seconds later, I realise the guards are lifting the bolt on one of the containers next to us. There is a brief sound of shouting, then someone sobbing. Then the container door slams shut and there is a hissing noise on the gravel. Someone's feet trailing in the stony sand as they are dragged away from the container. We crawl back to our corner. I fall asleep with numbers, names and villages running through my head, trying to block out the cries of the man who is being beaten in one of the whitewashed buildings. And that is the end of that chapter. A bit of a interesting one. We get a bit more information about how the boys are planning to escape or being told to escape. Doesn't sound very promising or very easy, does it? So, question 16, for chapter 16, sorry. Why are they going to risk it? Okay, this, it's very difficult, it's very dangerous. The chances of them making it are very small, so why are they going to risk it? Have a really good think about that answer and think about how you're going to formulate your answer as you write it. And question two, what motivates them? The, if you are motivated to do something, you, it's like you're being encouraged to do it. So what motivates them to risk running away and trying to escape? Right, moving on then. If you've finished writing your answers, of course you can pause the video and write them down. Um, but in the meantime, we shall move on to chapter 17. This chapter is called Fear. Okay, so the Eritrean desert looks like that. It is vast, it is very sandy, very hot, and there is not much to see for a very, very long way. Um, a bluff, if you can see that, so that's the ridge of the hill. And the watchtower, obviously there's people in a tall tower watching out for people trying to escape and they have rifles and guns trying to capture people. It's chapter 17, Fear. I wake as light shines through the bullet holes above me, a hundred small suns. Then I become aware of the eyes upon Binny and me again. The other men are awake. Now though, I see that they look at us with hope, not menace as I'd thought before. Time for me to test you, says Nabe. We move closer to him, and he starts by pointing from prisoner to prisoner, choosing either me or Binny to tell him their name, what happened to them, and any details of their family we might know. Although we speak in no more than a whisper, I know that the men are listening to every word. We get it all right. I thought everyone in this box was going to die in this box, but now you've arrived, that's not true anymore. Even if we don't get out of here, our stories might. Nebe says nothing more. I never noticed it before, but my life used to move at a steady pace. For the last week, time has taken a new dimension. I understand that it can accelerate in a heartbeat, then slow almost to a stop. I must learn to cope with a different rhythm. The container gradually heats up with the morning sun. Want to play chess? asks Binny. I stare at him blankly. I'll go first. I move my king's pawn two spaces to e4. I feel a smile creep across my face. I need to think for a minute. Okay, I move my king's pawn to e4 too. You mean e5, says Binny. Ah, so you keep counting from your side, and in that case, e5. I find it much harder moving the pieces in my head. After eight moves, it's checkmate. Binny beats me. Bad luck. He smiles. I hope not, I reply. With every bang of a container bolt, I wonder if the guards are coming to take me away for questioning. But today follows the same pattern as the previous day. The container becomes hotter and hotter, until all thoughts are pushed from our minds and we begin to doze again. I wake and notice that the temperature has dropped very slightly. No one has come to get us. In fact, the camp is very quiet. Do they come at the same time every day? I ask Jonas. Not every day, but if they do come, it's always before dusk. The bullet hole discs of light start to creep slowly across the floor towards the container wall as the sun sinks from its zenith. A few minutes later, there is a crunch of feet in the dust and a bang as the bolt of the next door container slides open. They must be going to collect firewood. Idris plunges the flattened bottle into a water jug, holding it under for a few seconds, then screws on the lid, dry, dries it on his blanket and throws it to Binny. Jonas passes the bag of bread to me. I stuff it under my waistband, then pour a cup of water and gulp down half, then give the other half to Binny. Binny is just rebuttoning his trousers when 
the bolt slides in on our container. The guard peers in. You, 87, and you, 24, out now, he shouts, pointing to me and Tesfe. He stares through the darkness. And you, 88, he points to Binny. We get quickly to our feet and walk to the entrance without turning round. My heart starts thumping like someone is banging the side of the container, and I'm sure the guards can hear it. Apt tired, whispers Binny. As soon as we step down onto the sandy path, they slam and bolt the doors, then push us in the back with the butts of their rifle, towards the men from the other containers, and then to the metal gate. Once they have unhooked the padlock and we step outside the compound, I feel a thrill of excitement followed by a wave of fear. It is hard to tell them apart. Binny and I shuffle like the others, perhaps even more slowly. I rub my eyes and stare at the ground just ahead of my feet, but my senses are drifting up towards the vast expanse of desert which surrounds us. There is a patch of scrub. Two of the prisoners start gathering small sticks. Okay, you pause the video here and read these next two sections. Okay, welcome back. I'll read that last little bit. Binny pinches my arm and I hear him muttering under his breath. Three, two, one. He sprints away from the bush towards the open desert. I throw my sticks to the ground and follow, zigzagging from side to side. Seconds later, I hear a bullet ricochet from the tree trunk and another whizzes past my head like a bee. Puffs of dirt jump up in the air as the more bullets hit the earth around us. We follow the curve of the hill until we're almost out of line of sight. My thighs are burning and my mouth is dry. I hear shouting behind me but don't turn around. Binny is just in front of me, his arm pumping in air and his feet kicking up dust with every pounding step. The only word in my head is run. Run! I try to imagine the border is just ahead and I'm running to cross it. I reach the point where my legs are about to collapse and my chest is on fire. Binny must feel it too because he starts to slow. We skid to a halt and look over our shoulders. We can see nothing but the small hill separating us from the camp beyond. I hear the deep sound of a diesel engine revving. Maybe two trucks. We, we look around wildly for a soft patch of ground, running slowly with our eyes down. Binny points to a long crack in the earth. It's not very deep, but it's our only hope. We get down on our hands and knees to feel the earth, to feel the earth either side. It's not rock solid, but it's not soft. It isn't soft either. The engine is the engine is no longer revving, but growling like a truck on the move. The noise growls louder, and it can only be a matter of minutes before we will be in the line of sight. Binny starts scrabbling at the earth with his hands like a dog, flinging dirt behind him. I do the same. My fingertips are numb and bloody after a few seconds. We don't dig down, but across, making the crack a little wider. Lie down, Binny gasps. Put your head by my feet and throw some earth over your body. We lie in a line along the crack, faces down, pushing our bodies as far into the earth as they will go. My chest heaves as I try to catch my breath. Sand and soil coat my tongue as I breathe with my mouth open, cheeks in the warm earth. The rumble of the truck gets quickly louder. I feel my breathing stop as my body tenses. I pray that we look like, look like nothing more than two rocky bumps in the uneven desert landscape. The truck is so close now I can feel the vibrations as it winds and revs over the rocks and sand. I will, my, I will myself to evaporate, to disappear, to become nothing but the dirt around me. I hear shouting from the truck and then the shouting becomes quieter as the vehicle speeds past us. Okay, pause the video, you read this bit, and I will continue afterwards. Okay, I shall read that last little bit, and we will continue together. I thought they were going to run over us, says Binny. That would have been pretty bad luck, I say. I feel almost dizzy with that. Give me some bread, he says, and I might let you have a sip of water. I chew the bread without sipping water. It, su it sucks all the moisture from my mouth, but eventually I am able to swallow it. The water is so precious I save it for a small sip uh, at the end of my feast or five, for, or five cubes of bread. 
We can rest for a few minutes, then it's time to move, he says. Do you think we can make it to the border before morning? I ask. Of course, he says. We've been doing nothing for a week. It's time we get some exercise. I smile again, then suddenly stop. You know, we've learnt names and phone numbers for the other prisoners, but we haven't learnt numbers for each other. Binny tilts his head to one side. For once, you've had a good idea. I'll give you my mother's number and the number of my cousin in London. How about you? I teach Binny my mother's number, Uncle Bathers and the number of our friend in England. We also recite the villages over our relatives, uh, the villages our relatives live in, although we already know these. Just in case only one of us gets a chance to use a phone when we get across, I say. He nods. We start to walk. My legs are stiff, my stomach rumbles, again fooled into thinking that the bread was the beginning of a proper meal. After a few minutes, Binny breaks into a slow jog. We head away from where the sun set and keep looking up to see if the southeastern star is out. The air smells of earth and the only sound is the regular crunch of shoes in the dirt. We are surrounded by desert, with a dark blue sky fast becoming black overhead. After a short while, we get into a running rhythm and my body starts to feel better. Still, we are silent except for the regular, regular thump of our feet. Then, without warning, Binny drops to the ground. I do the same. What is it? I whisper. I think I see the border fence, he whispers back. We must have been running for half an hour at the most. It's too soon, I say. I'm sure we've only come a few kilometres. Shuffling forward on our elbows like lizards, we stare intently but see The fence doesn't seem to get any closer. Binny, there's no fence. It's just the horizon. You're right, he replies. It's way too soon. I guess I was just hoping. Do you think we're still heading in the right direction? Okay, you pause the video here and you read this next little bit. Okay, welcome back and I shall read that last little paragraph and we'll move on together. The thought is so ridiculous that it seems almost possible. The fact we have nothing but a small bag of stale bread and a squashed bottle of water feels less important than it did a few minutes ago. When we get to England, I'm going to eat ice cream every day. Will you have time to watch Arsenal at the Emirates Stadium with me? Yes, I say. Something about the vastness of the desert and the sky which surrounds us has made us dizzy with excitement, even though we haven't made it over the border yet. It's like we've reached an unspoken decision to savour every second before the next trial. As we stand up, I become aware of a low rumble behind us and see headlights shining in two moving pools. They're looking for us again, perhaps with more men. The headlights are now facing in our direction. They're moving closer. OK, says Binny. Either way, we have to run. He doesn't need to tell me. I run with my eyes down. The moon hasn't yet risen and the ground is uneven and covered in small stones. After a hundred metres or so, I turn to see the headlights pointing straight towards us, accompanied by the low throb of a diesel. Like whoever is driving the truck is no longer in a hurry. Binny is twenty metres in front of me. I look up to see if there is any, any cover further ahead. I can make out the dark humps of low hills to the next left, uh, to the left, sorry. I fix my eyes on them and focus on my pace. I must not slow down. My breath is rasping and I feel like collapsing to the ground, but instead push myself faster. I'm catching Binny. I can hear the truck engine above the sound of my breath and the thud of my feet. There is a puff of dust from the ground beside me. Bullets. They are close enough to fire at us. Instinctively, I lower my head and try not to stumble. Binny does the same. There are more puffs in the ground either side. Binny shudders and yells out, then falls to his knees in front of me, clutching his arm. I skid to a halt next to him. What happened? I gasp, trying to catch my breath. They shot me in the arm, he pants. I can see something dark seeping through his fingers, pressing near the top of his arm. Blood drips in the dust. Binny stumbles to his feet and starts to walk. Each step jolts the wound. His eyes are tight shut and he gasps. Go! The truck is almost upon, it, upon us. Bullets whiz past our feet. Go! He shouts. Run! The headlights cast a bright yellow glow around us on the truck and the truck... 
around us as the truck bears down. I turn to look Binny in the face and see desperation in his eyes. As I break into a run, he tugs the water bottle out, of his go- out with his good arm and throws it after me. There is shouting from the truck and the puffs of, bullet- of more bullets near my feet. I pick up speed. The trucker, the truck, is no longer following me. I hear Binny shouting at the guards. Without consciously slowing, I am aware of myself coming to a stop and then turning round to see Binny. He is swinging his good arm at them, punching and yelling. He's giving me a chance to get away. I turn to keep running, trying to breathe through the sobs which are building within me, searching for the low hills on the near horizon with tears, while tears blur my eyes. I hear two shots behind me, then silence. I don't know how long I keep running until I reach the foot of the low rocky hills. I'm aware of the truck circling around in the desert behind me, but unless their headlights shine directly at me, they won't find me now. Binny bought me enough time to put at least 500 metres between me and the truck. That is enough. I scramble a short way up the hill. There are dips and bumps which offer some protection from the freezing night air. Ten metres up. I stumble into a hollow between two rocks. I scan the horizon one last time and see nothing but black desert. The areas of paler and sand or rock highlighted by the rising moon. Somewhere out there in the blackness is my friend. I curl into a ball. My mind and body can no longer cope with consciousness. I fall into a dreamless sleep. And that is the end of chapter 17 fear and I'm sure you'll agree with me that is not the end of a chapter that we like very much Um, definitely looks unfortunately like Vinny has been caught and is not going to make it so I'm sure you can imagine well barely imagine how Schiff must be feeling at this time not not in a good way so your activity for the end of chapter 17 is using a dictionary, I want you to find the meaning of the following words uh, and then try to use those words in a sentence. So your first word is menace, your second word is expanse, your third word is ricochet, and your fourth word is rasping. And then your last little activity, in a short paragraph, describe Schiff's feelings for his friend. And that is the end of chapter 17's activities. Okay. Your writing activity for today is looking at some character comparisons. And, as we have done in a lot of our other activities, we are going to be comparing Schiff. We're not going to be comparing Schiff with anybody else, but we're going to be comparing him with himself. So, look back at your role on the wall that we did at the start of this book. And I want you to have a think if you still agree with what you wrote down and see if you think that Schiff has changed. So... Your role on the wall, which would would have looked like this, on the inside would have been all the things you thought or knew, uh, and on the outside all the things we can learn from what he does. I've gathered a few bits of ideas on the next slide that I will show you. So the inference, the things uh, that were either the inside or the outside, I can't remember right now. He was kind, he was friendly, hard-working, trustworthy, uh, a bit unpopular, I thought, because he only seemed to have Binny as a friend. Very patient, respectful of his parents and his teacher, and quite confident in his own ability, especially in playing chess. Some of the facts that we knew previously about Binny, uh, sorry, about Schiff, um, was that he lives with his mum and sister, he's shorter than Binny, uh, he's not as clever as Binny, he wants to be a doctor, he plays chess and is good at it, his best friend is Binny, and he lives in Eritrea, and I'm sure there were quite a lot of other facts that you managed to gather as well. So, your activity... In your books or on your piece of paper that's on on your computer, jot down two lists about shift now. So don't worry about doing too many as your next activity will go into more detail. So it's about what we know about shift now. The inference based on the last chapter we've just read and the facts that we definitely know. So pause the video and I'd say no more than five or six minutes on this activity just to get down a few ideas about what shift is like now. So pause the video and off you go. Okay, welcome back, and we'll move on to your final activity, which is a character comparison. So we'll have seen one of these before. These are called Venn diagrams. 
It's where we can do comparisons and find similarities. So, in the left one, you will have a copy of this activity in your activity pack or in the email or on Seesaw, depending on where you're finding it from. So, on the left-hand circle, write down the things that we knew about Shift in the beginning of the text. So, based on what we did to start with, that should be quite an easy part. Uh, on the right hand, the things that we know about Schiff now and what he's gone through and how he has changed and the similarities is that section in the middle. So all the things about Schiff that I haven't changed at all. And I'll be interested if we can find quite a lot of those or if we won't be able to find many at all. Thank you again for listening and for your continued hard work and I hope you are continuing to enjoy this book even if it is it's a little bit of a sad moment right now. And I, as always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me because I will always do my best to help. Um, and you can always email me at the year six email address and I will try to get back to you there. Thank you again and I hope to see you soon. Bye bye.